India independent. A new nation is born. From north to south, from east to west, in every corner of this ancient land, so rich in culture and tradition, there was unbounded joy. For our people were rejoicing, ready to welcome the long-awaited liberty. A liberty for which they had fought, suffered and sacrificed. Centuries ago, when the nations of the West were living in darkness, our civilization was in flower. A civilization that has flourished for over 5,000 years. Ours is a rich inheritance. India, like other nations, has had her periods of glory and despair. During the latter half of the 18th century, a dark shadow fell across the land. 1757. At the Battle of Plassey, a fierce struggle ensued on the plains of Bengal. On one side were ranged the armies of several rulers, corrupted by intrigue, crudely armed and lacking cohesion. The other, the forces of the foreigner under Robert Tai, equipped with the latest weapons of destruction. The success of the British in this battle sealed the fate of India, and she became the vassal of a foreign power. As the result of her serfdom, the fingers of her potters began to lose their cunning, the skill of her artists grew less, and the workers in copper, bronze, silver and gold lost the secrets of their craftsmanship. Her Dhaka muslins, her Benares brocades, her entire trade and industry were crushed. Then came 1857, the Indian mutiny. India strained to free herself from the foreign yoke. But again it ended in a triumph for British arms. The revolt was suppressed and the people disarmed. In the years that followed, there was much despair throughout India. But though her body was enchained, her spirit could not be broken. India waited, waited in patience through the dark years for one who would set her free. At last he came, born in 1869. His name, Mohandas, Karamchand Gandhi. It was not long before the people recognized in him their leader, and in him were identified the oppressed masses of India. In him were focused the ideals and aspirations of those loyal sons of India who had died in the struggle. Nada boy Nauroji, Gokhale, Tilak, Lala Lajpatrai, Pandat Motilal Nehru, Pandit Malvia, Dr. Ansari, C.R. Das, Hakim Ajmal Khan. Gandhiji introduced a new technique into the political arena, Satyagra, non-cooperation. His shield was truth, his weapon, non-violence. And among those that gathered round the Mahatma are names that have written and are still writing glorious chapters in India's history. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, Babu Rajendra Prasad, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Sri Raja Gopalachari, Saraujini Naidu, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Jaya Prakash Narayan, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru with Abdul Ghaffar Khan, affectionately called by the people, the Fantia Gandhi. Gandhiji, the Apostle of Peace was also a man of action. In 1930, at the head of a vast multitude, he marched to Dandi by the sea and there exhorted his followers to make salt and thus shatter the alien government's monopoly. The rulers used force to overcome the opposition, but the faith of the people in Gandhiji never faltered. They used passive resistance and defied the law. And in the ensuing struggle, many lives were lost. 
And now the Second World War exploded across the earth. The whole world was embroiled in a titanic struggle between the forces of democracy and fascism. Although of Western origin, its repercussions were also felt in distant India. Soon our sons were fighting side by side with the sons of Britain. March 1942. Britain, in order to obtain India's cooperation in the war, sent out Sir Stafford Cripps to negotiate with our leaders. Numerous parties between Sir Stafford Cripps and our high-ranking leaders took place in New Delhi. Our leaders wished full liberty, liberty to wage war as a free people and not as vassals of another power. But Mr. Churchill, the leader of Britain's war cabinet, was utterly opposed to this demand. He said, we will under no circumstances agree to the liquidation of the British Empire. Indian leaders, in order not to fail the nation, made desperate efforts to come to some understanding with the British that might satisfy both sides. All to no purpose. Sir Stafford returned to England, his mission a failure. After the Cripps mission, Congress assembled in Bombay. Leaders and delegates from every part of the country came for the session. The air was charged with emotion and excitement. The leaders were faced with a dilemma. All were against the fascist powers and their brutal aims to enslave the world. Sympathy was with the Allies to help them in the war with every resource at our command. And the leaders put the question to Britain, how can we fight for freedom when we have no freedom ourselves? But Britain refused to answer. And then Gandhiji gave the nation the two magic words, quit India. He told Britain, we will fight the war against fascism as an equal partner of the Allies. In reply, the Conservative Party, then in power in Britain, clamped all the Indian leaders into jail. At this time, there appeared on the horizon in Southeast Asia, Subhash Chandra Bose, a loyal son of India. Force will be met with force, he said, and raised an army of courageous men from loyal Indians captured by the Japanese. Bose's aim was to use this, the Azad Hind army, only to make the British give India her freedom. Meanwhile, India's regular fighting forces had won the praise of the world as second to nothing. These sons of our motherland were courageous in battle and the chivalrous to the conquered. Their valorous deeds hastened the approach of liberty in our land. As the fascist hordes were battered into submission, freedom was in the making for our peoples. The new Labour government that came into power in Britain as a first gesture released our imprisoned leaders and the nation rejoiced. Britain now sent out the cabinet mission headed by Lord Pepic Lawrence, a genuine lover of freedom. Among the cabinet mission were Sir Stafford Cripps and Mr. A.B. Alexander. On arrival at Delhi, negotiations were immediately started with our leaders. These were anxious days for India. The nation lived through hopes and fears. The discussions ended. They were a success. But unfortunately, the country was to be divided. We were to emerge from our 200 years of bondage as two nations, India and Pakistan. It is the night of August the 14th, 1947. The auspicious moment is on its way. In every house throughout the land, the lamps of good fortune are lighted to illumine the path to freedom. Large numbers have foregathered in every Congress house. And in New Delhi, the Constituent Assembly is in session. Babu Rajendra Prasad, the President of the Constituent Assembly, during his speech, had this to say. I want, on behalf of this Assembly, to assure all the countries of the world 
that we wish to be friends with them. We hold no enmity against anyone. While Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said, We stand on the threshold of freedom. I want to assure everyone that India is a country for all. It does not belong to any special community or religion. It belongs to all. The hands of the clock move their way towards midnight. All India is expected. the country chant prayers and invoke God's blessing for the newborn nation. And the flag of India, our flag, the tricolor, is unfurled. The Constituent Assembly rises and stands in silence for two minutes in homage to those who gave their lives to win freedom. Jai Hind! Victory to India! And with the dawn of August the 15th, the nation celebrates her freedom. At New Delhi, vast crowds foregather in front of the Parliament buildings. The Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, followed by members of the Cabinet, descend the steps. Government House, in the historic Dunbar Hall, Lord Mountbatten is sworn in as India's first Governor General. Then, the Prime Minister and members of the Cabinet are sworn in. The new Governor General and his lady drive in state to the Constituent Assembly. At the Constituent Assembly, he speaks to the nation. at last free. India services were not forgotten, for they also played a prominent part in the day's rejoicing. Look at this crowd. It watches the national flag flying from the ramparts of the famous Red Fort at Delhi. In Bombay, the day celebrations commence at Gowalia Tank Maidan. It is the same story everywhere. Vast and jubilant crowds. A fire? No, just an ingenious way of paying homage to one of the nation's departed leaders. The Premier follows an old Indian custom. He plants a tree, a symbol of India's future prosperity. Another highlight of the day was the Freedom Procession, with Young India this time in the lead. 
India is a secular state, and these Muslim volunteers are Indians first and last. India's womanhood, so patient in adversity and who suffered in our struggle for freedom, now march with heads held high. Stage and film stars help to entertain the crowds as they pass by. Indeed, it was a picturesque cavalcade worthy of Bombay. In Calcutta, the largest city in India, there was jubilation, thanksgiving and celebration. Martyrs were remembered. A portrait of Subhas Chandra Bose, a worthy son of India. Madras was also all paid. Civilians and service personnel helped to make the day a great success. Liberty and happiness marched hand in hand. And look at Jabba. Even the elephant enjoys freedom. In London, Britain extends to the new nation the warm hand of friendship. Patrick Lawrence attends a ceremony in honor of Indian freedom. The British were among the most eager to welcome India's independence. Mr. Belodi, India's High Commissioner, spoke to a distinguished gathering at India House. He said, Today is a great day for us in India. It marks the end of one chapter and the opening of yet another. And let us hope the most glorious chapter in our history. Let us prove worthy of this freedom. Let us dedicate ourselves today, faithfully, to use this freedom nobly. Singapore, Malaya. It was the same story. Indians gathered in large numbers to celebrate the newfound freedom. At Canberra, Australia's capital, the selected assembly of Australians and Indians gathered at the residence of the High Commissioner of India, Sir Raghunath Paranjpe. After a fitting speech by the High Commissioner, the flag was proudly hoisted. Dr. Ebbett, Minister for External Affairs, was also present. Toronto, capital of Canada. Here again, Indian independence was celebrated in an appropriate manner. Washington, Indian independence was warmly celebrated. Mr. Asaf Ali, India's ambassador in Washington, presided on the occasion of the flag hoisting ceremony. The whole world rejoiced at India's freedom. But the man who made it possible, the father of the nation, walked with a heavy heart. His vision was of one land, one people, one nation. But it was a dream that never came true. And thus, freedom returned to ancient India. With freedom came a realization of the beauty of our land. With its picturesque hills and valleys, its snow-covered mountains, and its babbling waterfalls. Blessed by nature, and with a vast potential of mineral resources and manpower, it will be easy for us to regain our proud place in the forefront of the nations of the world. As free men, we offer the hand of friendship to all lovers of freedom. The glory of our freedom, flag of our nation, we salute you. Jai Hind.